none of Liz, but I always know she's right there, ready to turn the computer as needed. Oh, are you going to move it? Yeah. Oh, and Isaac's in the room today. Oh, and we got Missy back. And can you go back to the can see if you figure out the screen? Oh, right. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> for the windows but that's all right now i won't be i still won't be able to see you this yeah but you can see more of the students as well <laughs> okay um well good morning today um we're going to um Talk a little bit about your rumination assignment um, so that you guys can get going selecting topics for that. And then we'll kind of pick up on our conversation from yesterday and wrap up the first unit uh, prolegomena about, you know, kind of how we have this conversation about God. So that's the basic plan. Um, is there anyone who would like to begin us with prayer today? Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you that even through this all, we're still able to continue our schooling and continue learning more about you and more about how to properly think about you. I pray as we go through this that you align our hearts with you more and that we learn and are better able to share this knowledge with others. In the name we pray. Amen. 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 I like that word, align our hearts with you. Uh, that's good. So, um, in the interest of I like to do the housekeeping first because once I get going on the conversation, um, it doesn't end until class is over. So then I run out of time. So again, if you have your syllabus handy or if you can pull it up on popular or something, or actually, let me just, um, I'll just screen share mine um, because most of you can see that. Um, I want to talk. So yes, last on Tuesday, I always say yesterday. What I really mean is last time we met together, which was not yesterday. Time flies, you know. Um, but we, in our last meeting, we talked about the uh, the rumbling assignments, which are kind of like belief statements or like unit reflection um, papers where you articulate kind of what you're thinking about a particular doctrine um, or section focus of theology. In the ruminations, it's more of like a research exploration. 
Um, and the, the downside is you haven't gone through the course, so you don't know what you'd like to spend more time on. Uh, but the hope is that maybe you can take some time over this weekend and look ahead at the things we're going to cover and find a couple that sort of perk your interest um, and, and let me know what they are. Um, and the idea is you just choose two things that sound interesting and you kind of spend some extra time uh, researching them and, and writing about them and then presenting back what you find. And, and this is, um, so if you go here, essentially you will research two topics of your choice and communicate what you learn either by writing a paper or by doing an oral presentation. And the either or is kind of important in this assignment. And here's, here's why I do it. Um, different people have different gifts. Some people, uh, and, I, and I found this out when I started reading your papers, some of you guys are excellent writers. Um, and of course I haven't gotten through all of them yet. Uh, I graded some on on Tuesday, I'll probably get back and try to get those finished up today. Um, but I, I mean, I was I was pleasantly surprised and impressed um, at the, the quality. So thank you. Um, but I've also had students who like you put you put a piece of paper or a computer document in front of them, and they are completely frozen. And it's like climbing up uh, the side of a, of a skyscraper with nothing, like no rope, no hands, no nothing. And it's, it's an impossible task. Um, so, but sometimes those people have an ability to communicate verbally that is, that, that kind of compensates for their, uh, struggle with writing. And so if that's you, I want you to be able to learn from and do this assignment and learn from it and communicate what you learn in a way that is um, more fitting for you. Um, so that's what the choice is about. Um, there's another choice in this uh, assignment and that is the topic. Um, I want you to pick something that interests you, something that you, you say, oh, I want to know more about that. I've always had a question about that or that, you know, chapter title or subheading looks like it's kind of uh, like scratching an itch that I've an intellectual itch that I've had for, you know, a long time or, or that's a brand new idea that I've never even thought about before. I want to know about it. So, <clears throat> What that means is you're not all going to write the same paper on the same topic. And what that also means is your paper isn't going to be due at the same time as everybody else's. Because what I'm hoping is that you will write these and if anybody does a presentation, you'll be ready to give that presentation on the day that we would talk about that topic in class. Uh, or roughly corresponding to that, right? So let's say, um, let's say you wanted to, to, to investigate the Trinity in some greater depth, then your, uh, paper would be due. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop this and just share my screen so I can switch to the syllabus. Um, your paper would then be due. Well, that is the syllabus. <laughs> Somewhere right in here, where we t where we talk about the Trinity in class. But let's say uh, somebody raised a question last class period about the image of God. Let's say you wanted to to um, to study that. Then your paper would be due maybe on one of these days. Um, so you have some flexibility here, 
not only to choose something that interests you, but also to choose something that puts you in a good position not to have seven papers due in the same week. Does that make sense? You can just nod your head if it does or shake your head if it doesn't. Um, okay, so let me go back down. I didn't get any real definite nods, but I'm, I'm assuming you guys are tracking. Um, okay. So typically I introduce this like the first or second class period. So we're a little behind the ball. Um, but basically what I'll do is I'll give you the weekend to think about your topic. Um, topics, you should put some thought into it. it. It's not set in like hard concrete. If you, like I've had students who pick something and then within a week or two, they start looking into it or they notice something else and they're like, hey, can I change? As long as you've got enough time to still do the project, that's fine. But I don't want everybody changing every week. Um, so try to put some thought into it, pick something that you can stick with um, and pick something that fits into your calendar in terms of when your papers and other classes are due and things like that. So basically you're, you're either going to write like about a, I don't know, I think that's about a six ish page paper, six to eight page paper, or uh, craft your, your, um, what you learn into a presentation. Um, and Mr. Taylor. Yes. Um, if we choose to do a presentation, is there a time limit? Um, well, my hope is that, okay. So I was just reading about presentations. Um, the short answer is s sort of like you shouldn't, you should probably present for, like it says, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, but my hope is that your presentation creates some discussion that then carries us into the rest of class. Um, so, uh, and kind of mark this point. The point of the presentation um, isn't just to show me what everything you learned. The point of the presentation is more to help your classmates participate in what you learned or to, to share what you learned. So in other words, you're trying to be more of a teacher than a reporter. Um, and the, the thing is you have to learn something along the way. You have to know before you can help others learn. So I'll, I'll get the fact that you learn something by the way that you draw us into that and help us grasp it, help and help your classmates grasp it. And also, I don't know if it says it in here, but probably what I should do is just have you turn in instead of a paper, like turn in the notes you took to create your, you know, your, your, your presentation plan or turn in a PowerPoint or something. Um, just something that is tangible that I can look at that kind of can conveys some of the work you did, but the, but the presentation itself is really to share um, and help others kind of internalize what you learned rather than just to report it all. So in other words, if you were gonna, if you were gonna, there's, let me illustrate those two ap approaches by how you would do a PowerPoint. In the first approach where you're just reporting your, what you, what you know, you'd put a whole bunch of text on all the PowerPoint, that's all the data that you found, and you'd basically read it to us or you would um, uh, you know talk through it you'd kind of like you might like really bad presentations at academic conferences they're just people reading papers they're boring um, 
But if you were going to try to share the knowledge and help us grasp it, you might kind of zero in on a couple ideas that you encountered and then create a way for us to get there with you. Maybe it's by asking a question that sparks a discussion, which hopefully I'll illustrate for you later today um, how that works. Or maybe it's by doing a little activity um, that helps us, for example, um, on the image of God question, like maybe it, it wasn't in this class. It was in a, it was in the meeting with the online only students, and Hannah Hannah Gafford was saying, "Yeah, I've always kind of been curious about what what makes people different than animals." And I I said, "You know, another way to frame that question is kind of what defines the image of God, because that's one way that a lot of people have thought about it is this this thing that makes us distinct." So. To, to enter into that conversation as a presentation and and as a as a teaching exercise, you might put the class in groups and say, make a list of things, it, ways in which people are different. You know, humans are different than animals. If that gets us thinking, that engages us in the process, and then we have a discussion about that. Um, versus. I studied the image of God and I found that, you know, the defining characteristics of humans is the fact that we are creative or that we um, have a higher ability to reason than any other creature. You see the difference between just saying it and like bringing us into it. So that's the big caveat. Um, if you do a presentation, the hope is that you'll you'll do it creatively and you'll draw us into that. But uh, so you'll want to interact with sources. You'll want a bibliography. Um, and here's kind of the process. I would start by looking at the course calendar up here at the topics and by looking at your textbooks um, or another way to do it would be go online say uh, Alistair McGrath Christian theology hmm what's Christian theology about well Here's a good introduction. It's from the bibliography in our syllabus. I'm going to hope that this has a preview. Doesn't look like it. All right. Okay, we'll find a different theology. Look inside. Hmm. It's got an interesting cover. Let's look at the table of contents. Holy cow, that's small. Um, and I look through here and I think, okay, that's all about Jesus, the Bible. Oh my gosh, that's a long table of contents. Oh, this is a this is a history. Shoot, it's the wrong book. Anyway, my point is, look at your textbooks. Look at, uh, let's, let's look at practicing, no, that won't do, that won't do, uh, here's a really, a really, uh, popular one, uh, that's not going to do either, that's going to have a hugely insane table of contents, sorry, this is taking too long, um, Here's the brand new second edition to Mike Bird's book. Why are they not giving me previews? My point is, look through the table of contents in a theology book and look at the, the sections 
of theology that we're covering this semester. Revelation, um, theology proper. See if there's things in those headings or that strike you. And then start, you know, browse through that section of the book. Um, maybe even read it. See if there's something you want to zero in on that you're saying, man, I really want to investigate this more. Um, and then kind of see where it connects with our course calendar. And, um, or if you don't know that, just tell me what you're thinking about and I'll tell you where it connects and I'll tell you, you know, kind of where I would stick it on, uh, the calendar and, and that will be your due date essentially. Okay. Does that, are we clear as mud at this point? Okay. Crickets. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was step one. Find a topic. Um, if you can do that by Tuesday, that would be grand. Um, please, actually, please do that by Tuesday. Um, then this next part, um, is I think helpful is probably not absolutely crucial because you could write a really generic paper, say on God. Um, but I think you'd write a more interesting paper if you focused on um, the the doctrine of like divine um, a say I think it's a say um, this notion that God doesn't change and that he that he like kind of doesn't have emotions. Um, or, which by the way, I think is bunk, um, or maybe you're curious about God's, uh, how can God, is God so powerful that, no, let me rephrase that question. Can God make a rock so big he can't move it? And how does that, um, you know, connect with the idea that God is all powerful. Well, if he's all powerful, he can be able to move anything, but if he's creator, he can make anything. So how do those sit in tension or, Ooh, here's a good one. If God is the creator and he's, you know, sovereign and in control of everything, then why is there so much evil? Right? So that's a more interesting paper than I'm going to spend six pages telling you all the generic stuff about God. See the difference? The, the focus allows you to go deeper. Um, okay. Once you've got some focus and narrow, narrowed your topic, then you start reading. Um, start exploring. Start learning. Um, I think a great place to start is systematic theology textbooks. Um, that might not be the, the end of the story in terms of your research, but um, read two or three of them. See what the different perspectives are out there on the topic you're looking into. See what the key questions are that are being raised and talked about. Um, that might allow you to focus your paper even more. Um, if it does, that's great. If you stay at that level of specificity where you are, that's fine too. Um, but it'll it'll also lead you on to more sources. And I realize sources are a little hard to get right now. Um, you know, if money is not an issue for you, you could buy things on Kindle and have them right now. Um, otherwise, you might need to use Google Books and try to search the samples, um, you know, and get what you can that way, or find uh, articles through like a you know a, a database. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to find enough to, um, have a good s selection of sources. Um, and then just like in the rumbling papers, please interact with some scripture. 
um, you know, when, as soon as you start reading the, the textbooks, you're going to realize, oh, there's some like core biblical texts that impinge on this discussion. Um, for example, if you're, if you're looking at the image of God, every single discussion is going to talk about Genesis 1, 26 and 27. You know, God created human beings in his image and the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And so you'll have to um, talk about that text in your paper if your paper's on the image of God. And so you might, some of your sources might be commentaries on Genesis, you know, to help you understand what's going on in that text. Um, and then, so once, so basically choose your topic, focus your topic, research your topic, and then write it up or create a presentation out of it, uh, which is number five. Um, organize it, try to get some flow, particularly if you're writing a paper, um, well, project two. Like you want to have a, you want to start beginning, middle and end, right? And the, the old famous advice, tell the reader what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And particularly at the beginning and end, um, when you're anticipating and summarizing, if you can add a little creativity there, um, a little thing to hook interest. Um, and sometimes it's even helpful to, to tie back to that at the very end. Um, kind of come back to your hook and, and put a nice bow on things. So in other words, put some effort into writing well and um, that's all. So there's that. I didn't mean to take half hour to explain it, but such is life. Questions? Comments, cries of shocker, outrage. Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, so I will make a note on the 15th. Um, how about this? Since we're not meeting in class, usually I just do this at the beginning of class. Sometime between now and the 15th, shoot me an email with the two topics that you would like to, to, to cover. And then um, I'll reply with the two dates that I think would be best to have those connect with our syllabus. And then if there's an issue on scheduling, like you were thinking, oh, I thought it would fit the next class period. I have a paper due that day. Um, we can negotiate on that, but, um, that, that I think will be an easy way to just track that. Um, you shoot me topics, I'll shoot you dates. Sound good? Okay. Let me stop this. Go back here. So today... Um, we kind of want to follow on from our discussion last time, which, if I recall, ended with the idea, we talked a lot about humility in theology, and the idea that humility allows us to see other perspectives as a gift instead of um, as a problem, to see people who think differently from us as allies instead of uh, enemies. Um, it also just helps us encounter the truth about God, actually. Um, I would like to break you guys into rooms um, and have you spend a couple minutes thinking about what do you think God, is God's or one of God's most essential qualities. Um, you can, if you can narrow it down to one, that's great. Um, but the the two or three of you that discussed together, 
don't come up with more than two. Like, what's the very most essential thing that we need to know when we when we talk and think about God? Um, so, in two, one, two, three rooms. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. So the, so the classroom, you guys can break up into uh, like two groups. And then I'll put the other four of you into two groups, just sort of randomly. And let's take, uh, let's, this shouldn't take long. Let's take like a minute and a half, and then I'll bring you back. And you can tell me what what you think is the most essential thing about God. How many are in the classroom? Five or six? Six? Okay, so you can either do pairs or you can do groups of three, whichever you prefer. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, what did you guys come up with? Um, let's start with. Uh, was it Nicholas and Nancy? Yep. Okay. We got. Okay. So the first one we said was uh, provision. Uh, uh, provision shows that God is trustworthy, faithful, he's reliable, and he is worthy to be depended uh, on and praised. Okay, so 
I see how you were sneaking in some some other uh, attributes there by <laughs> <laughs> making uh, provision the basis for others. But that's good. Okay, that's kind of the point. Um, okay, Alicia and Grace. Um, so we said that um, God is like protector. He's um, powerful enough to be our protector and he's loving. Yeah. You guys did the same thing, you sneaky people. Um, okay. So there were two groups in the classroom. Why don't each of you have a spokesman or two or three, I don't know, and tell us what you guys came up with. So for our group, which was Timothy, Liz, and I, we went and just went love because love, when taken to its logical conclusion with justice, love and justice are generally pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. One who loves will want what is best for the other. And in that case, it would be justice. They would want what is right to be done by them. Okay. And love is kind of one of those all-encompassing words that includes a lot of other virtues, like first okay. Corinthians 13, right? So you can sneak a whole bunch in with love. I like it. Okay. Uh, last, last group here. Hey, so um, we said God's perfection, and by God's perfection, we mean that He is not, He's a person that's not capable of sinning. Um, he's like a, He's basically, he, you know, He can't sin, He's super perfect, and because of that, it's, He's someone that we praise and we worship. I think that if He was able to sin or if He was capable of doing evil, um, that'd be a whole different story. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay, now let's take um, these and play a little thought experiment. Is there a way that you could play any of these off against each other? I mean, they, there is a lot of overlap, like... Um, you know, protection and provision are would seem part of the outflow of love, and they're they're uh, uh, um, aspects of what love would be like. And um, but c could you imagine these being pitted against each other in any way? Even if the terms were misunderstood from the ha from the way you guys intended them. Yeah, I think I see. I can see one, one way is imperfection, inability to sin. That some people might say that misapplied justice would be a sin, and therefore say the love, including justice and the perfection, would be against each other. Okay, so I think what you're getting at is someone who can't sin and is perfect, um, he could be worthy of worship in that respect, but could also be kind of a hard-nosed character who might not be very gracious. And therefore, we might question whether we could really call them love and whether, we're, whether, really, whether we could really subsume love underneath, or I mean justice as a part of a loving character. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Um, which actually has happened more frequently than we might like to admit in history, right? Um, you're, you guys, I'm sure, are aware of... People that... Say that again? I think a lot of people that don't have a relationship would say, well, if God's such a... If God loves us so much, why doesn't he... Why doesn't he protect us? Why do, why do bad things happen? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, you're getting at this problem of evil thing, right? Um, and that... Um, I think that goes hand in hand with this God that, that is high and holy and perfect, but he might not be that kind, you know? 
I, I'm going to give you an example of what happens when you take that to the extreme. Um, you guys familiar with a guy named Richard Dawkins? Anyone? Okay, a couple. So Dawkins is a, um, I think he's a biologist, molecular biologist or something like that. He's, he's a very well-known atheist, uh, contemporary today, and um, pretty outspoken. He's got lots of books. And I'm going to read you one of, the, one of his most famous quotes. Okay, and, and he, you'll see that he veers toward the side of this God who, whether he's perfect or not, I mean, clearly he doesn't think he's morally perfect, but he certainly isn't very kind and gracious. He says this, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now, if I was really skilled, I would have read that to you in a British accent, uh, like Dawkins himself has, and it would have sounded even worse. But that's from his book, The God Delusion. Um, and you can clearly see where he stands on the whole God question. But uh, I, I say that to illustrate that um, we can kind of emphasize certain things to the exclusion of others. And, you know, that that takes, like I said, that takes it to a, a, a huge extreme. But I think most of us in our theological tra traditions do something um, similar to a, a far lesser degree, obviously. You know, we don't go to the extreme of saying God is a, is a jerk. But, but we, we can sometimes um, highlight or emphasize certain traits and de-emphasize others. Right. And one of the things that uh, I remember one of my profs saying when I was in school, he was he taught me the prophets and he would say from time to time, you know, because the prophets are poetry. Right. And they use lots of metaphors for God. And he would say there's lots of metaphors for God and they're different and we need them all. Because if we only had, say, God is my rock and my fortress could we could we maybe leave some aspects of god's character out of our theology yeah if god is our warrior like think about the 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 children of israel coming out of egypt right and they sing um the the song of moses um or the the I guess it's Moses. Moses and Miriam led them in this song. And, you know, God has triumphed victoriously. Horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea. God is a warrior. Okay. That's one of the, probably one of the texts that Dawkins has in mind when he thinks about God as this capricious, violent bully, right? But let's, um, let's think of another famous text in the Bible. Psalm 23, how does that one start? Anyone who's not muted, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, God can both be a warrior, fighting and defending his people, and he can be a shepherd, like, tending and, and providing and um, you know, uh, making the table before us in the presence of our enemies and leading us beside still waters and, and all those images, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And you might think that those things don't fit together, but the Bible says they do. 
and groups of people might emphasize one or the other and if they do they might kind of get out of balance in their theology right um so all that to say when we come to god we come to a mystery and we've we read this in Catholic, we've talked about this a little bit already, but we come to this this person, he is a person, who, or a communion of persons, there therein lies the first ministry mystery, is that God is personal, but he's in he's personal within his own self, because he's three persons. So just let that blow your mind for a second. Um but we often we often verbally recognize this idea that God is mystery, but I think sometimes then we go to work theologizing and we theologize all the mystery out of him. And we decide these are the things that are really true about God and those other ones, um, maybe not as much. Or we don't, we don't, we kind of mute some texts or we silence them. We'll read a little bit about this when we read McKnight. Um, he talks about the blue parakeets, these, well, I won't wreck it for you. Um, so what I want to do now is take a few minute break, give you a chance to, to move around, get your blood flowing, look out, out the window, and then I'll come back. We'll do one more question and one more kind of uh, pass through this, this issue of um, how our theology can kind of not only skew God's character, but like sort of take some of the mystery out of it. Um, and then we'll talk about why we need tradition. So let's, uh, let's come back at, it's like 1137, just turned 1137. Let's come back at 1140. And then I'll put you back in those groups for one more question. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Sound good? All right, I'll see you in a few minutes got to unpause the recording so welcome back those of you who are watching after the fact sorry you just missed the uh, question was uh, what did the cross accomplish and the class had very good well-rounded out answers so now I'm asking uh, if we've heard the cross talked about in terms of uh, like a legal transaction where we're justified in court or as a as the payment of a debt right there was a and and i think most of you were shaking your head yes kind of like these are these are common categories for us to think about um the cross and salvation uh there was a really influential uh theologian in the middle ages called anselm and he popularized this idea that uh that Christ died to pay a debt uh, for that we could never pay. He, he talked about it in terms of the honor, the debt of honor that was due from humans to God as we're his creatures and he's our king and we have to honor him. Um, but then that same kind of debt payment uh, category was used in the future and, and you know in the Reformation and afterwards to think about it like almost an economic debt. You know, we, you've probably heard a sermon where, or even like the parable of the, the unforgiving servant, you know, Jesus tells this story about a guy who gets this gigantic debt uh, forgiven. And then he turns around and he yells at somebody who owes him just a, a much smaller amount. And, and we'll often think of that as a, as a way of thinking about salvation. Like, Wow, we've had this amazing debt uh, paid, and and there's precedent for that. Like, like uh, you know, you can find passages in Paul where that um, that kind of imagery is used, and per, per particularly the courtroom imagery, you know, of of Jesus taking our place or paying, uh, you know, paying the punishment for our sins or um, uh, taking, you know, taking the hit that we deserve, basically. So it's there in scripture. What I'd like to ask, and, and your answers have already kind of, you know, clued into this, is, 
is that all there is? Is it bigger than that? Um, and you guys, you know, you mentioned defeating death, you mentioned redemption, you mentioned uh, breaking down the barrier and the, and the alienation between humans and God, all of which are um, kind of other, other lenses through which we can look up at what Christ accomplished that, um, that broaden the picture. But here's the thing, we've, we're, we're talking, you know, um, about who is God and this idea of theology speaking of God. And I want to suggest that those different perspectives on what the cross accomplished, they carry within them different perspectives on who God is and how God operates, right? Because if the cross was the work of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, then how he did it says something about who he is and what kind of person he is. Um, that text, in fact, in Paul, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, is one that I think has sort of been pushed to the sidelines in the last couple centuries when we've focused a lot on transactional models. Because if you think about the courtroom, you know, um, motif, you can go into a courtroom and you can have, you know, as the story goes, the defense attorney stands up and says, yes, this person is guilty, but I have already paid their debt. I've done, taken their punishment. And so I would like them to be called innocent and free and vindicated, right? And all that can happen without you really knowing the judge or even the defense attorney who's, who, or, you know, who stands in your place and, and sort of takes the punishment. But reconciliation, that word that Paul uses, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that carries a different, um, a different understanding of God's purpose. It has to, reconciliation goes beyond a transaction where a debt is paid or a punishment is served, right? What does it involve beyond that? It's okay to unmute and say something. In fact, you don't even have to stay on mute while you're in class. Um, Unless you have dogs like barking at your feet or something. Can you repeat the question one more time? Like, so if you've got <laughs> so, take legal, legal, uh, legal transaction, you know, or even economic transaction. You know, debt is paid or punishment is served, and 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 then on the other hand, reconciliation. What, what more is assumed in reconciliation? Or what's, di what's the different assumption in reconciliation than in a, 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 a legal kind of model? Yeah. That the person who pays the debt is the one who actually is the one who you want the debt to. It's, it's assuming the relationship beforehand that has been broken that needs to be repaired. Okay, okay. So there's a reparation of relationship that's either in addition to, you know, on top of the, the payment of a debt. Because a, a, a transaction doesn't necessarily require a relationship, right? You can walk into a store and buy your Doritos or whatever it is you like and exchange money. Or better yet, you can... You can go to the, I mean, because in the, in the, you're not, we're not just buying something we want. We're, we're paying like a fine, right? So let's say you get a traffic ticket. You go to the, wherever you're supposed to go. You write your check, you pay your fine, and it's done. Um, but reconciliation assumes more. Um, and 
<laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so here's the here's the point. Um, it doesn't just assume more about what Jesus did, it assumes more about what God was aiming to accomplish. And our, your theology and my theology has been um, powerfully shaped by the judicial and economic metaphors. It's, that's, that doesn't mean that our theology is better or worse or, or wrong. Well, it kind of does, um, but what it, what what I'm suggesting is that just like um, some of the examples we talked about before, if you emphasize one thing and de-emphasize another, you're going to end up with a skewed picture. So when we talked yesterday about humility um, enabling us to listen to other people. Where I want to take that today is humility, humility um, opens up our mind and our theology to different voices and different perspectives, um, which we could call tradition, either other traditions that are current today or the great tradition of the past, which is basically like a living dialogue with all the smartest Christians who've ever written. Uh, not who've ever lived, because there's certainly some uh, brilliant spiritual people who never wrote it down, but some of them did write, and their works remain, and we can go visit them, and we can kind of knock on the door of another world, and maybe even another worldview from a different time and place, and we can hear things that will help us think in new and different and fresh ways about the scripture. So when we do theology, obviously we want it to be based on scripture and we want it to make sense and we want it to resonate with our experience. Those are three sources of theology, scripture, reason, and experience. But the final source of theology is tradition. And what tradition does is it complements those other things. It helps us understand that the way we reason and think is a product of our time. So someone from another time might think differently. Um, it, it takes us out of our sort of cultural box. I talked about Anselm and his theory of, you know, the debt of honor. That's totally middle-aged feudalism, like wrapped in biblical language. So he was a product of his time, too. But he still gives us another perspective, even if it's not like the only biblical one. Um, and tradition also helps us read scripture. Um, we are not ancient Near Eastern people, newsflash. Uh, but there are people who are a lot closer to that time and, and, and worldview who... Um, I mean, if, if, if you dropped a biblical person in our world, think about how confused they would be. Like, what is this little screen that we're all talking to each other through? What is that little thing in your pocket that, like, you keep looking at and you talk to people on and you do everything else on? Um, why is there water coming out of that little pipe in the, in the bathroom, you know? Like, nothing would make sense. But, um, and likewise for us, if we went back, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. But there are a lot of people who have been reading the Bible for a lot of years who are a lot closer to that world, and they can help interpret it for us. So tradition complements our reason, our own experience that's in our own time and place, and our reading of Scripture. And so I think it's important for us to as Scott McKnight says, read with tradition. Um, not against it in the sense that, hey, um, those people, you know, had everything wrong and we've arrived. Um, not through tradition in that we say we belong to a certain tradition and it basically determines everything we're going to say about theology before we even start. 
but with tradition, um, where we respect and receive wisdom from the voices of the past. Uh, and as I've learned to do that, it's been hugely eye-opening. And you'll all have the privilege of sharing a lot of that with you as we continue. But um, today was a case for um, perspectives, AKA tradition, help us see in new ways. And it's important to include them in our conversation when we do theology. Only one minute over time. Thank you for your patience. And uh, it's been good to be with you today. Thank you. All right. You guys have.